Well, well, thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Craven. I'm the director of the Washington office for UNFPA, the UN Population Fund. And it is my incredible honor to be able to be here today to have a conversation with two of my favorite people, uh, Ifra Ahmed and Mary McGuckian. Uh, we met uh, almost a year ago in Nairobi at the Family of Women Film Festival Nairobi Summit version. So um, it's exciting to me that the film that we uh, saw in Nairobi is now coming to Sun Valley and that I have a chance to talk to you both. So I guess the first question I just want to say is, how did the two of you meet? And, you know, Ifra, your story is incredible, um, but where, you know, where did Mary find, find you and how did this story um, come to film? Do you want to start, Ifra? Yes, Mary, Ifra? I can't. <laughs> yeah. Can you remember? <laughs> yes, of course I can I'm remember like, so very me? well. Okay. Okay. I think yeah. we find each other. <laughs> we find each other in France <laughs> uh, during the Cannes Film Festival. And I remember uh, you were doing some work with your colleagues uh, about Ethiopian uh, filmmakers. And I was there with a friend of mine who was then working, uh, was working with you in HCR. And I remember having a dinner and exchanging talk and having a lot of conversation. And I remember telling you that I'm from Gramkondra, where I first mm -hmm. stayed in Ireland. <laughs> And I think we had a bit of laugh. And yeah. I, this question, you know, is, is something that comes every day when I talk to people. And, you know, it's a question that first people ask is, where do you two met? And how do you met with Mary? And who introduced you? So, um, yeah, I, we met. But I remember also uh, Mary was calling me and saying that uh, she's not sure if this, uh, you know, is going to, make the film but she will promise that she will do whatever it takes to do and i remember um having a conversation all the time so we met in uh in france mm. and i actually i told her that i was irish <laughs> i might be the first black irish <laughs> well i remember saying because you said drum Condra with such an irish accent and then you said i if you don't believe me i have a passport and I said, no, I do believe you. Given that accent, I don't think you need a passport. <laughs> Everybody knows you're Irish. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But yeah, there, there was some chat about, they wanted, I think, to make a documentary, you and HCR. And then I realized that, that there had been a documentary already made in Ireland. And then you told me your extraordinary story. And I, I make movies. I don't make documentaries. And we talked about how difficult it is to make subjects that are, that are, single character narrative female stories and particularly female stories on sensitive issues and more particularly female stories on sensitive issues. Now this is before hashtag me too or any of that and uh, particularly stories with diverse cast and uh so yes we were managing expectations but let's try but i can't promise anything wasn't that it <laughs> yeah well, it, it's, it's very clear that from that meeting the two of you are great friends and collaborators and um, I think for me, from watching the film, because if I know, you know, you're an incredible advocate and activist on the issue of FGM, but when watching your story, it's just a piece of a lot of issues that you dealt with and a very harrowing journey that you took. Um, I mean, I know from my experience from watching, I've watched the film several times, I'm just, you know, my heart is racing with you. And, and that must have been very difficult um, to not only film, but also to watch. How has that, I'm sure this question is asked for you a lot, but how have you um, experienced watching your story on the screen? Um, the first thing that I get so emotional watching the movie before it was released or before we're showing any other people with Mary was my grandmother part because my grandmother passed away and um, watching you know her character was played it takes me back um going back to somalia in 20 uh, for, uh 2013 or 2014 meeting with my grandmother and having a conversation 
and also, um, you know, feel like I wish my grandmother was still alive and she could actually, you know, see the good work I'm doing and how today is still young girls are suffering and dying because of the consequence of female genital mutilation. But uh, that didn't happen. So that part was so emotion because I grew up war and everything was happening was actually being in a Somalia, born in Somalia and, you know, born in a country where it was a uh, civil war. And only thing we see is fight and rape and blood and all that. But uh, watching the movie, my grandmother was a big part of my life. And also uh, getting the necklace, which I, I wear every day uh, when I think my grandmother. So um, it just rem remind me, uh, my grandmother, becoming Irish citizen and returning home and meeting with her that gets so emotion on me and I felt I wish I could share a lot and today she could see what I'm doing now it actually helps with many young girls to save their lives so it wasn't easy but uh, also uh, when we watch on the movie on Bobbly with other people and I get uh, answer like other women who come from whether Somalia, whether the African, other African countries, where the um, the issue of violence was such a normal thing. When they say that this related to, the, to their life or related to their mothers or you know aunties or sisters, it made me to say that I am so proud that I at least I spoke for not only my voice, but many women who cannot have this voice. So that makes me more actually proud and also strong to watch the movie and say, you know what? Hearing those women boasting and telling me that it might be my story, but it related to them, make me to be really, uh, you know, make me to be a really uh, strong and say, yes, you know what? I have done a such thing. It might be my story on everywhere, but I'm telling many women who have suffered with a lot of different violence stories. So that things that really make me keep going and I really appreciate also whenever the movie is played that, you know, a lot of people who give the positive uh, and comments and all that makes me, you know, keep going as well. So it makes me more stronger. Well, I, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, as I say, the movie is so, it's such an incredible journey. And to see your journey through, uh, through that actress, uh, as you say, is telling the story for others everywhere. They're seeing mm -hmm. their lives within, within you. So I know your grandmother would be so proud of you. And uh, we're just so proud of you because um, it takes great courage. Mary, yeah. um, translating that story was this the first time that you had done a film um touching on i mean these are you know difficult issues, oh, with issues yeah. um, facing women around the world but not issues that are usually covered by uh you know mainstream directors how, tell us how did you get this film made well um as you say it, you know it speaks to it, it's not it's not my experience so it was very important that we, everybody involved recognized that this is Ifra's experience. Um, and as an Irish, young Irish woman, Irish Somali woman, uh, that, that it was a story that needed to be told. It touches, as you say, on sexual violence conflict, female genital mutilation, um, uh, gender-based violence generally, and, uh, you know, so, so and, and, and ha but has a, a phenomenal, well, for me, listen, Telling the story of a, in movie form is not really so much about the story as the character. So you, if you don't have a character, you don't have a movie. Otherwise, you, you are making a documentary. So I suppose, you know, Ifra just is one of the most phenomenal, charismatic people you'll ever meet. And, you know, she has a phenomenal charm and uh, uh, charisma that everybody responds to, be it in an IDP camp or, or at, a, at a high level event. And, and that, and her achievements seem to me to be not just her your healing effort but you know you know this because we've discussed this before but also the the capacity to move hearts and minds that is 
fundamental to change when we're dealing with human rights issues um, is, is the great power that she has. So to me, it became a movie about the power of testimony, about the power, what happens when one young woman has the courage to stand up and tell her story. And we now know in the last few years, with all of the movements uh, that have taken place that the, that the great change can happen and has happened recently as a result of that testimony. So uh, of the result of the power of testimony. Uh, so to get it made, we just happened to be hitting, I didn't think it would be possible. Uh, we just happened to be coming into a time when, particularly in Ireland with Waking the Feminists, there was a move, even in the film industry, supported by, say, for example, Screen Ireland, to really start looking at, at you know, putting your money where your mouth is in terms of films by, by female filmmakers, films that, that reflect the world in which we live, films that reflect modern Ireland, films that deal with important uh, um, issues for about, about women and particularly diverse characters in film. So this was kind of slightly putting it up to the world to say, you're all talking about this, this film ticks all those boxes, write the check. And <laughs> to be fair, they did. So we got to make it. And um, the, was it filmed? Tell me where, the, where it was filmed. And In terms of practically, it was it, what, you know, a complex story that takes place in a number of countries. As you know, it takes place in Somalia, partly across Ethiopia, oh, Kenya, actually, um, uh, Belgium, across Europe, Ireland, where Ifra landed, and then, of course, our many travails across, across Europe. So we split it into three sections in a way. There's the story that happened in Somalia, the story that happened in across Europe and the story that happened in Ireland. So Ireland, we shot for Ireland. All of mm -hmm. Europe, we shot in Belgium. And then everything that was Somalian exteriors, we shot in Morocco in the end. But we were very anxious to make sure that people, so if it was very across every aspect of the film from the story to literally the design, the costume design and the authenticity of everything Somali. Well, it, it was, it's, it's stunning. And um, you feel like you're right there. You feel you are, you are making that journey, and um, it's, uh, um, well, we were together in Nairobi in November, and this was a, a, a real special treat that you allowed us to screen the film there, because the premiere, I believe, was in February. Um, mm -hmm. Little did we think that we would be facing a pandemic. So yeah. tell mm. us about how, um, how you've had to, uh, Get the film out to the world right. uh, under an unusual time. And right. also, Ifra, maybe you can also talk a little bit about how the pandemic might be impacting your work. So first, just on, the, on getting the film out, um, and I need to say thank you, Sarah. It, was, it seemed like a crazy thing and, you know, very distant, the idea of showing a kind of a version of the film in Nairobi to me. And I think, Ifra, you'd agree. It was probably the worst possible circumstances, a bit of a download with a mixed sound thing, with an AC getting in the way, with 100 people crammed into a room for 60 people sitting on top of each other, and the picture was kind of faded, I think. But I've never known a screening have such impact. And on a, if you can speak to the people who were coming out and talking to you and going back in again, and we, maybe we come back to the impact that that has had on IFRA's work in Somalia and the projects that are emerging out of that awareness. Um, in short form, otherwise, yes, the pandemic completely crashed our release. We were due to release the film on April 3rd in the UK, Ireland, across Europe and the US. So what has happened instead is it has all, we moved straight to Showtime. So it is widely available in the US on Showtime. And we've rescheduled the cinema release in Europe, or particularly the UK and Ireland, for during the 16 days of activism from November 25th to December 10th. But let's go back to Nairobi, because IFRA, that was a real turning point for us, or for you, especially with IFRA Foundation, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, the movie before we were showing in around Europe and Ireland and UK and, Festivals. you know, mm. and uh, Washington, I remember we've been there and, you know, mm. but um, when we showed in Nairobi, it was completely different uh, audience because, you know, the people were from almost every African countries. And, you know, mm -hmm. thanks to you and FBA and Sarah taking the movie on board because the people in the room, they were not only Somalis, but there were a lot of young Somalis and there were a lot of um, women's 
and there are people from other countries and you know it it was for me is to see how people receive the movie in other well, other part of the world and i think that it was you know i i met people on at the door some people they were crying some people they were so emotional they couldn't watch and they come out and some they were saying why our african leaders are still so dumped and they're not doing right things why are these things are happening in africa why are the girls are suffering why our mothers are such things are happening so that make me really lifted up for me uh, in terms of the way people will see the movie in africa so it was really great start and yes as you know COVID has actually changed things in whether the movie was released or even doing more in Africa. But um, for me, if I talk about how, uh, you know, COVID affected the work I'm doing in, in Somalia, it's uh, at the moment, there's a lot of things happening in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the increase of the female genital mutilation with still young girls are at risk, uh, not only at risk, but even the guests when they are cut, there is no way they can be getting the health facility because the whole hospital during the last three months, the hospital were closed for public. So um, we had young people who were in the grassroots. Uh, we have this youth group called Ambassador Network that who were going to the grassroots, who were doing a lot of um, talk with the, the IDBs and different places. So we were hearing the story of, you know, um, Young girls, they've been cut at home and they've been bleeding and there was no way they could get a, a medical attention because the hospital was closed. People were afraid to go out and, you know, God knows now how many girls have been died because we don't know things were very done. But um, the effective of the COVID is because uh, the FGM is increased and also uh, violence is there as well because young girls are being raped in Somalia. So um, a lot of things happening. I cannot fly and work there, but uh, we have a group of people who are working in Somalia and doing the activities. But um, the issue is that, you know, the FGM has increased and that is actually really heartbroken. And then also uh, the problem we have is that uh, Somali government, they have the sexual offense bill in the parliament and there was a lot of debate and now they cannot pass the bill, and then I'm worried that the bill we were working for a long time, long time, which is a female genital mutilation bill to legislate FGM in Somalia, what will happen if now sexual offense bill has rejected? It means that FGM bill will not go ahead as well. So it's been really, a part of the COVID has been really heartbroken within the federal government because FGM bill is there sitting with with the government and nothing is happening so um it's just a lot of things going on at the moment which we hope by end of the year we can catch up with things and we can fix it and you know walk on again well i mean going back to nairobi i can be i can bear witness that it was like being with around a rock star because that was the reaction that you got ifra and i remember afterwards when we were all outside you know, the crowds, I have photos of the crowd surrounding you. I was trying to get through to say hello. But, um, and then also I just have to say for Mary, I remember I walked in and somebody who was helping us had like a frozen smile on their face and they said, everything's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be okay because the um, download wasn't working. Um, and, it was, it, and, and Mary, you were just an incredible um, pro because we, I think, used one of your director's cuts and I, know how kind you were to oh, really not yeah. to have you know so um but I, I think what's 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 interesting about that is it in the end for all of us filmmakers who you know who are kind of very particular about our our the way our films are shown in the end it doesn't really matter it's 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 what what the feeling is and um, and what came out of that screening was an awareness among certain kind of quite high level people who were there that that the level of response needs to change. Um, and IFRA and IFRA's foundation now, I think, are really seeing that while COVID has interrupted it, and we've all had to cope with it in the same way that all other organizations and activities have had to, and become more digital and become, look at things from a different, 
you know, find different processes and find workarounds. The fact of the matter is that there is what wasn't there before that, which is a, a, a focus by a, a, on FGM as an issue in its own right, not just as, as one of a general group of gender-based violence issues and a recognition that something needs to be done. It needs to be done at scale. It needs to be done over a long period of time on a sustained level at capacity. And so if I think it'd be fair to say there'd be quite a, an exciting announcement, you know, a project has emerged, which will be at a national level um, that is being funded at a bilateral level, that a bilateral donor level um, that has had to be re-devised around COVID and inevitably quite digitally based. Um, so that that's exciting, I think. Don't you think, Ifra? It's tough, I know, yeah, at the moment, is, but, but there is a plan. Yeah, yeah. there is mm. a plan. Mm. <laughs> She's going quiet. Because <laughs> you can't announce it yet, but you have been working so hard on, on this, this alternative way of, of trying, a radically different approach. Yes. I could talk about it, but I was told not to talk to you. Yes, you're not like, because it'll be announced. In, yes, it'll be announced in October, November. So, so that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I, I guess what I was trying it's, to do is not be as downbeat. Mm. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, my internet was down for a minute. Can you all hear me now? I yeah. can, yes. And I'm worried that I'm going to go offline soon. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm going to ask my quick final question to both of you. Yeah. This audience is going to want to know how can they get involved? What can they do? How can they support you, IFRA, the IFRA Foundation, and Mary on action steps? So both of mm -hmm. you, before we lose Mary um, and IFRA, give us, give us the call to action. How can we help you move this forward? IFRA, do you um, want to take that we, up first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, we have IFRA Foundation uh, website, which is ifrafoundation.org, and also we have, we are on uh, Twitter, and we are on Facebook, on Instagram, and every time I speak, I say every little helps, even, you know, people sharing the stories, sharing, you know, stories of FGM, talking about it, people who meet with other leaders, decision makers, to share with the stories, I think that makes difference as well, so... I say and I call people to actually whatever the, whatever way they can get sub, um, involved. We are welcome. Uh, you know they can support even sharing posters or information. It it helps. Donating to Ifra Foundation to make a difference also it makes difference for the other lives as well. Mm. As Ifra always says, it's it's in every woman's story. Ifra is one of two hundred million women worldwide who are living with the consequences of FGM. It's a huge issue and anything anybody wants to do, be it on social media, writing to their ministers, writing to their, uh, just engaging on any level. There are many, many activists out there, lots of CSOs. And if you have some influence, please use it. It's something that should not be happening in the 21st century. Well, I, I wholeheartedly concur. And I want to thank you both. Um, Ifra and Mary for joining us today. I want to thank Peggy Goldwyn and the, the team with A Family of Women Film Festival. We all wish we were in Sun Valley, um, mm -hmm. but thanks to Zoom, we were able to join you tonight. So God bless thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all very, very much. <laughs>